Thank you all for joining Toxin Magazine's The State of Rochester. Tonight, we will talk about the family dollar incident where we witnessed Simran Gordon being shot by police officers. So before we get started, I would like everyone to go around and introduce themselves. Um, we will start with Angela, Reverend Bamford. Hi, everyone. My name is Reverend Angela Bamford, and I'm glad to be here. I am a minister, a storyteller, an author. I do a variety of things, and I like writing for Toxin Magazine, too. Um, I'm very concerned about the issues that are going on. Police brutality and um, injustice is not something that is new for us. And if we're not part of the solution, we are the problem. So I'm not going to get into any of it. Okay. Hi, my name is Barbara Grosh. Uh, this year I'm president of the League of Women Voters. So I'm uh, spending a lot of time trying. We tried to organize debates for all the elections around Monroe County. Uh, it seems like the candidates aren't too interested in debating this year because we're only holding a very small number of debates. But we've also been uh, working at trying to get the, um, the county legislature redistricting commission to listen to residents. So that's been a big focus. And I just met Shanique last week and we clicked. And so I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Fred Tinsley. I'm a community activist um, with the Take It Down Planning Committee and the Faith Community Alliance. And um, I'm happy to be here and very ready to get us all engaged in this conversation. Good evening. My name is Howard Eagle. I'm part of the Check It Down Planning Committee, Faith Community Alliance Coalition, and I thank you for inviting me. I also write from time to time for Toxin and uh, Minority Reporter. Good evening. How's everyone doing this evening? Thank you, Shanique. Thank you, everyone, for the evening. Mario Mangione, uh, part of the Take It Down Planning Committee, Faith Community Alliance Coalition. Looking to have an informed discussion tonight. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I guess we're doing introductions. My name is Antonia Winter or Tony. Um, currently a candidate for Rochester City Council at large, founder of the Facts Youth Program, a member of Community Justice Initiative, a member of Rock the Peace, a member of a lot of organizations and movements and causes for the betterment of our community. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Shirley Struthers, and I'm a member of the Black Storytelling League of Rochester, also the Aquaba, uh, the Heritage Associate, Socius, and uh, I thank uh, Reverend Angela for the invite, and uh, I look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Again, we are discussing the incident of Simran Gordon. Uh, police footage was released to the public, and according to reports, he was in the process of robbing uh, the family dollar on West Main Street. So I want people, instead of us just jumping in, there's a few more people this time. Uh, if you could raise your hand, if you want to start off the conversation. Um, but what we're talking about, do you think it was uh, a cover up or justified? Uh, that's basically what we're stating. If people saw the video, do you believe what you witnessed is what was reported in the news. Okay, um, I have I have a couple of questions, and I, I need my uh, all the information so that I can make an intelligent decision. One of the questions ooh, was um, if if the guy was supposed to have been holding Simeon, right? Simran, um, if, if he was um, holding it up, what? Why did he have his hands in his pockets? And they tell him to take his hands out of his pocket. Um, to me, that's not 
being in a uh, threatening position for one thing and um I don't know that the video that I was listening to, the one that was calling the 911, she sounded awfully calm. And everyone was, uh, maybe maybe it's just me, but everyone seemed to be a little more than calm. Um, and are there videos in the store? Don't they usually have videos in the store? Where is any of that footage? So they have not released the footage of the video from Family Dollar. The only the only footage that we've seen so far is the footage from the police cam, body cam. I, I really haven't heard much from Family Dollar. I believe they released a statement, but if anyone knows anything more, you can jump in. I believe Family Dollar recently released a statement, but I don't believe they've said much about this incident. Mm. And I, I didn't see the guy with the gun and I didn't see him shooting anyone. And I don't see from the video, the guy had his hands, the officer had his hands on him and he continued moving forward if he would have shot even from the left hand that would have thrown him in a in a very awkward position to be shooting at anyone and i don't think he would have been shot in the in the position laying in the position that he was laying in if he was cuz it wasn't a long way a long distance from where the guy had his the officer had his hand in the pocket or or close to him before they had him on the floor i just need some of those answers okay okay mario yeah shank thank you shanae um one of the things that I have, I take issue with is that Rochester for decades have had problems with the police and community relations for a long time. And there's been all kinds of problems in this community between the police and the community. And so one of the things that's pretty troublesome for me is that there is this rush to judgment on a police department to say to the community that this is all well and good and everything that you're seeing is what we're seeing. So this is no problem. It's problematic because there's nothing definitive that I'm almost certain that everybody here can say that this was justified or whether or not this was a cover up. So if there's anything that would suggest that this is a cover-up or a homicide, we just don't know because I don't think anything that anyone here is seeing and anyone in the community is seeing based on the evidence that's presented to the community, which is just uh, a couple of angles of the police body cam footage. So if we are to believe that what we saw in the Daniel Pru incident wasn't a homicide. How can we justify and say that this was not some of the same? So the community is owed the full story and the full transparent story. So that's probably where we should start tonight. <clears throat> Antonia? Um, so I, I was gonna I was saying, like Mario said, we do have a fundamental problem with our local law enforcement that predates Daniel Prude. Um, even, I want to say, there was a gentleman named Lawrence Rogers or Roger Lawrence that was killed at what used to be the Wegmans on Driving Park. It's Price right now. Um, in a similar fashion as George Floyd with the knee on his neck 10 years ago. And I guess we, we forgot or, you know, got swept under the rug. Um, so we need to really start there. And as far as this specific incident goes, 
the problem with not only our law enforcement, but our local media is there's a narrative that's been put out prior to any evidence being shown to the public. And it's almost like a psychological warfare. That's what media does. And they give this narrative, they plant seeds in people's head, and they set the table for the, 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 the nonsense that they want to feed us, right? And we're all human beings, and many of us are ingesting and listening to what's being told to us. And then when a video comes out, they're very specific in what they show. They have redacted video. They have edited videos. And they're really showing you what they want you to see that will fuel the narrative they already told you. So that's what happened with this situation. The other issue is there's a lot of evidence that conflicts that they're withholding. Um, I saw with my own eyes, nothing hearsay, nothing anybody told me, nothing I heard. There is footage from inside the family dollar that shows a very different view and a very different angle. Um, the 911 call from the young lady who claimed that there was a robbery in progress, her actual audio, her actual statement to the 911 dispatcher does not reflect what was actually happening um, based on the footage from inside the Family Dollar store. And then the question begs, why didn't they release the audio, the Family Dollar footage, and the body cam at the same time? They will at some point. I believe some things are being subpoenaed. Um, and when they do, it's going to give a very different view to the people who are saying, oh, he was shooting. Because you got to ask yourself, did you really see a gun? But again, when, when we talk about that psychological warfare, when we talk about what mainstream media does, um, it plants seeds in your head, you know, and, and, and you're seeing things that literally aren't there. I've watched the video many times. I don't know who else has. I've, I've you know, I, I've seen video slowed down, rewinded. You don't really see a gun. You know, so when you when you when you when you hear that there was a shooting and they say it was a shootout, you do hear bullets, but you never see Simran with a gun. And if you watch the body camera footage from the officer, when he gets into the store, the first thing he says is, does anybody in here have a gun? He's asking a question. If there was a gun present, he wouldn't have made that statement. And his next move is telling Simran, get your hands out of your pocket. Take your hands out of your pocket, which lets you know Simran's hands are in his pocket. I also want to let people know Simran had a cast on his right hand, which is his dominant hand. And they came up with a story about him shooting with his left hand that also there's no shooting with his left hand on, on video. So we asked them, did you find a gun on his person? They said yes. And at that time, pictures were presented to the family by the by um, RPD and um, the attorney general's office, an investigator from the attorney general's office, six printed pictures of some gun that they claim was found on his person. And they also had bullets and markings from bullets that were found um, in merchandise in the store from a gun that was fired. And so the question was raised, was ballistics done on this gun that you claim you found on Simran to match the bullet, because if there's a shootout, potentially there's more than one type of bullet, right? We know that. So was there ballistics done to match those bullets that you found in merchandise to the gun that you claim you found on his person? The answer was no. I asked, did you guys do forensics and find any gun residue? As we know, if you fire a gun, you're going to have gun residue on your hands. The answer was no. So my response is, how dare you present these pictures and take this position when you haven't done any of these, uh, you know, any of these scientific things to confirm what you're saying. So people are just supposed to accept this as truth when none of the stuff that you're supposed to do as a law enforcement official to confirm this was done. And from what we saw in the video, he did not have a firearm. Um, they showed in the video a paper bag that they claim was uh, that had the gun concealed. They put video out with captions and arrows and all this animation, which to me is extremely bizarre. You're leading, you know, you're leading and you're trying to feed more of people's thoughts into what you want them to believe. And as we know, Simran went to the liquor store before he went to the Family Dollar. 
but they're telling people that the gun was inside a paper bag and it's just almost like um it, it, it's just very bizarre they're just like really really reaching and grasping and so it's very important that people really do see all the pieces um as it plays out because it's almost like the more that we're finding out the stranger is getting but definitely definitely i'm saying that i believe this is a cover-up based on what I witnessed with my own eyes and my own ears about Mr. Gordon. He was murdered by RPD. Howard? Yes, um, I want to um, kind of echo what uh, Antonio just said, what Mario said, especially as it relates to the long history of cover-ups, uh, clearly in, in the Rochester Police Department. And that historical context is very, very important. Antonio mentioned Mr. Lawrence Rogers, who was murdered for all practical intents and purposes at the former Wegmans over on Driving Park. There was uh, Calvin Green, who was murdered in his attic in a crawl space. Um, there was um, Greg Hurd, who was murdered because he was uh, driving toward police in a car. And there are many others. If I do a little research, I could come up with, I'm sure, at least 10 more names of people who were, uh, I believe, murdered by the Rochester Police Department, but they were exonerated in uh, every case. Um, if I could just uh, read something just for a minute, if I could read something here, if I could find it, I thought I had it. Oh yeah, uh, only in America can police respond. I wanna raise an issue through this reading that's related to this. Only in America can police respond to separate calls for similar incidents and have two drastically different results uh, depending on race of the suspect. A variation of that dichotomic truth continued to play out in real life in Florida early, early Sunday morning when Brian Riley, uh, high on methamphetamines, killed uh, four people he didn't know, including a baby, a mother, a grandmother, before shooting at police and later separately attacking a different officer. Former Marine sharpshooter Brian Riley will have his day in court after killing four people and shooting at police. Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd said during a press conference that Riley was a cold calculated murderer who uh, was ready to do uh, ready for battle when he went uh, on his shooting rampage in Lakeland, which is about 36 miles northeast of Tampa around 4.30 a.m. Sunday. In another stunning example, an armed white man who allegedly shot and injured a police officer after barricading himself in a home during a contentious standoff with law enforcement managed to be peacefully arrested in North Hollywood, California in June. Police responded to a report, uh, uh, to a reported active shooting and somehow took the armed man into custody without resorting to lethal force, uh, which we see officers use so many times with unarmed black people. I don't want you to think I'm making this up. I'm reading from a News One uh, article that was uh, published September uh, 7th, 2021. Uh, and one other thing from that article is uh, an incident in North Hollywood came nearly two weeks after a suspected double murderer who was also accused of a, a range of other violent crimes was safely taken into custody without police uh, resorting to any violence, let alone lethal force. Uh, Peter Manfredonia was arrested in Maryland six days after he allegedly killed a 62-year-old man with a machete, held another man hostage, stole the hostage's guns and vehicle, killed a former classmate, kidnapped the former classmate's girlfriend in her car in Connecticut. Um, and then there's uh, Floyd Ray Raz Roseberry, Jeffrey Nichols, Robert Aaron Long, Duke Webb, Thomas Kennyworth, Kenworth, Dalton Potter, Gregory and Travis McMichaels or McMichaels, however they pronounce their name. And then of course, most of us probably remember the famous uh, Dylan Ruth who killed nine uh, parishioners in church in a, in a historic black church in South Carolina. I'm making the point that there is a long history of police officers uh, apprehending white men and, and the, even that article that I was just citing for has a scores of other names in it. And this is one article. So this is a pattern. This is a historic pattern that will produce thousands and thousands of cases where the same thing happened. White men who are completely 
like just violent as you can get, shooting at the police, killing people are apprehended without being hurt, without being killed. Uh, and then we can put side by side a, a list just as long or longer of black men who were doing similar or sometimes exactly or less than the same things, and they are killed in almost every instance. This is not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. I'm raising it because related to this is, in my view, the need for serious anti-racist education for all police officers. And there are some who will argue that ain't going to help. I've heard the arguments. People say that ain't going to help. And we don't know because it's never been done. We know that police get this cultural sensitivity training and they get DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion training. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about serious anti-racist education. So it's never been done in this nation. I refuse to believe that if, if officers are really put through serious, rigorous, uh, um, authentic anti-racist education, when they show up in a situation such as what happened at the pharmacy, at the, at the dollar store rather, they, that, that education will kick in because we have a basic problem of police officers seeing animals when they look at black people and we know it, we know this. They're seeing, they're not seeing human beings. They're seeing dangerous animals and they are reacting as if that's what they're dealing with. But when they see white people, they see human beings. And if, and if racism is not the common denominator, then I challenge anybody on the globe to explain what the common denominator is if it's not racism. And I did see the video. I watched all four. The uh, police department, RPD released two and the uh, uh, state attorney general released two. I watched all of them over and over and over again. There's not any clear image of, uh, of uh, uh, Mr. Gordon with a gun. There's no clear image of him with a gun. There, there's no, as, as Antonio said, there's no clear image of a gun. And so I'm very, very suspicious of it. And I do, my, my gut tells me that it is a cover up, but not only is this is not just based on my gut, it's based on the historical pattern that I was just talking about. Thank you for letting me rant. Antonio? And, and, you know, not just with RPD, even the paramedics, when they get to a scene, um, they come with a bias that doesn't activate them to do what they're supposed to do, which is preserve life, regardless of what the situation is. Simran was handcuffed with his hands behind his back. And I'm not a medical expert, but I just believe that laying on his laying on his uh stomach laying on his chest with bullet wounds in his whoever in his in his back or side or or what have you couldn't couldn't could could definitely have contributed to whether or not he lived or died and by the paramedics coming there and i believe there was even some commentary by one of the paramedics some some snarky remarks i'd have to go back and really see exactly what he said you know, they, they don't come in like, we have to save this person. They come in like, oh, another, another dead nigga, you know, another, oh, well, he's robbing the store, that's what he get, you know, and people have to also understand that there's due process, or supposedly in this country, right? And people, um, I guess, depending on your skin color, you're, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. But as we're seeing, the, the police officers are be, becoming judge, jury, and executioner. And in a court of public opinion, you know, people say, well, he, he was holding up the store. Hey, it is what it is. You know, and then we just we just brush this off and it gets swept under the rug and nobody really knows the real truth. Black men get silenced through death and their story gets told wrong and the story is inaccurate. And it continues to paint the picture of black men in our society that they're criminals, they're thugs, they're beasts, they're animals. You know, and so that just fuels more of that of that um, ideology. And these officers, they go to the academy and they and they have this basic sense of cultural training, like Howard was saying. But there's really no depth to it. There's really no real meat to them being immersed in the community, understanding what people go through, and understanding how to um, have a sense of viewing everybody like a human being. You know, so that when you do see an individual. When you do see an individual, you know, your first thought is this is a human being. This is a man. This is a woman. This is a child. You know, this is not just some inanimate 
inanimate object. This is not just a monster. You know, this is not just target practice. This is not just uh, an object that you shoot at, you take down, you haul off, and you toss away. You're not a piece of trash. You know, so with all of that, you know, we even ha- we, we we're we're regurgitating a lot of the traumatic nonsense that's that's been a part of our existence for for decades and, and hundreds of years. And even when we see things happening to our own people, our innate response is not, wait a minute, what's going on? It's kind of like, yeah, you know, that you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. And I'm not about um, um, condoning stuff or not holding people accountable. But, you know, we're just so desensitized that we're not even, you know, asking questions anymore, I guess I want to say. We're just taking things at face value and we're not even, you know, diving in or picking it apart. And we're fighting amongst each other when people are saying community, something is not right here. We need to unify. We need to ask questions. We need to stand up. And so now the advocates become the villains and the victims become the, 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 the you know, they, they get vilified as well. You know, and you have a small number of people that are saying we need to wake up. We need to at least ask and we need to get all the evidence and then you know, let's not judge too soon. So, you know, there's all of that going on as well. Akila? Good afternoon. Well, actually, good evening now, um, everyone. Uh, I was going to mention about the due process, and that's absolutely right. What Antonia was saying is that, you know, um, our people are not getting due process. Um, And then we have to understand what kind of courts we're dealing with in um, each jurisdiction, each d- department is has a policy that they deal in only in business. So we have business companies who are mishandling the citizens. And when we look at uh, certain classes um, here in the city of Rochester, the city of Rochester is also a corporation. We start looking at it. Well, I've been looking at it as, well, we can become product of our environment. And that's a true statement for the simple fact of if they choose to dispose of us, they're treating us just like product and property. And this young man, even if he had heard that this man had a gun, because that could have been a a possibility, you know, and he decided, oh, I'm going to go get him, I'm going to go target. Oh, I know who this person is. And he may have already had a vendetta out because he has maybe come in contact with uh, this individual. A lot of times that happens. We have these officers that do not know the law. I actually had took time out to meet with uh, Sheriff Todd Baxter. And as we were going over some information, we were talking about the roles of the steward of the Constitution, which is the one who is supposed to protect the Constitution and the rights of the people of the Constitution. Now, if we have may not been written into that Constitution, then they need to treat us accordingly to who we really are. But they won't tell us. They'll keep calling us U.S. citizens and treating us less than a U.S. citizen. And if we have certain rights, we should be able to have the same equality of life. But what's happening is if we are dealing with a society that does not look at us as value or have anything of or they look at our character or define us as being a certain way, then we need to step away from that society because that society has not is not being beneficial to us. If their only means is, well, I want to destroy you and get you out the way so that I can have what you have, then we have to move o- away from them. We have so many different ways that we can go about dealing with these people. We can do petitions and get the, the, the community involved to say, hey, do you want this? You, you can change the rules, the laws on how things are being done. You have representatives, people who are supposed to speak on your behalf. And if these people are not properly speaking on your behalf and they're going and they these policy enforcers think that they have the right to just go ahead and take out anybody, then obviously the laws that they're putting in place have nothing to do with us. This all has to do with business. And this young man losing his life, he was treated like a piece of 
like a like animal, just shot down in the street, kill him, and nobody gets to hear his story. Whatever his name was, shot him. We need to be going off after his insurance bond, after his uh um his uh securities because he has taken the oath to uphold certain things, and his job is not to take uh a life or to take someone's freedom away, life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness. His job is to protect the corporation. Now, the corporation was not in danger. They assumed he they were in danger. And then what was they in danger from? So they say, oh, a robbery in progress. If he was down the aisle, where was the robbery at? Who was he holding up? Who was he dealing with at this time? So they don't want to try facts. They don't want to try anything. They want to create a narrative and a story and create the argument to say that this person was wrong. And even if they're covering it up, we need to go after them individually and we need to hold them individually liable because you did not have the permission to take anyone's life. There was no threat there. Even if you said and you thought you're trained to use good conscience, good wisdom to look at certain details and any, any one of us can walk with our hands in our pocket. Now that starts to become a crime if you have your hands in your pocket. Now someone could tell you take your hands out of your pocket at any point in time and they're taking over your personal liberties and freedoms. Who are they to do this thing? He has to leave that store in order for a, a crime to be in progress. He did not leave the store. Fred? Um, I think everything that everyone has been saying has um, been true. Um, but the issue at hand that we're talking about is what happened with the young man at the family dollar. And I know past is, has some relevation on present. That is true. I do we, are we looking at all the different aspects? I know the, the young lady, Antonia, um, I'm assuming was at some presentation to be involved or uh, privy to some things that we are not, um, were not privy to. That being said is that, okay, the lady who made the phone call, the 911 call, was it actually a robbery? That's, we need to start at the beginning to unravel this. Was it a robbery? And I know we're looking at, you know, well, she seemed kind of calm. Well, if you were locked in a room, and you thought somebody had a gun, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be screaming. Um, and I don't know how I would react in that given situation, but I don't know whether she did see a robbery in progress or was it not? From what I'm hearing that most people are saying is that there wasn't a robbery so much in progress and that the officer maybe assumed something that wasn't in evidence. According to when I heard the first message is that she described what the guy had on. And I'm assuming that that's where the officer got to target the young man um, before he um, fled. So I'm not I'm trying to unravel the pieces as they happened to get an informed decision or process in my mind of actually what was transpiring at the time. Um, should the officer have chased him if he ran? We don't, I mean, I don't know. And I'm beginning to see that is, the question becomes, was there a robbery in progress? That seems to be the most critical question. Um, his hands in his pocket, it seems like the man the one young man that was in the red shirt, um, as the police came towards the guy in the blue, he started backing up. And maybe, I don't know if he didn't say anything because if someone has a weapon, um, are you going, as soon as the officer come in the store, say, there he is? Or are you still gonna be quiet because you, are not sure if your life is still threatened because the officer walked in the store. So these are things that I'm looking at 
and trying to get an informed decision on what happened. There are pieces that are missing. I didn't see a gun. Um, in some of the conversation that I heard, it said that there was a bullet hole traveling towards the, where, the direction of the officer. Um, I'm not sure that there was no other officer in front of the officer. So I'm not sure if one of them shot, if a bullet, you know, what, where would that have come from? Or was it a bullet hole from in the store that was there from a month ago or a week ago? So there are so many gaps here that it's hard to make an informed decision. So I just want us to be cautious that we're not doing the same thing that they're doing. We're not shaping a narrative to um, force what we believe to be so. And if that's the case, then we're just in much danger of doing the same harm as we're saying that they are doing in the process. So I just, I just want a lot of answers to some critical questions that will set the stage as to say, and definitively what happened here. Antonia? Fred, I appreciate everything you said and, and you're absolutely right as far as anal, anal, analyzing information goes. And so based on, like I said, what I saw, I, I, I took that to only give the facts of what was shown, what I saw um, to try to sift assumptions and hearsay. I've had people come to me and say, well, the streets are saying this, the streets are saying that, and I, I hear y'all. But based on what I saw, based on what I heard, based on body cam footage that was made public, these are the facts that I'm, I'm using. So for me, from my standpoint, there isn't as much um, gap. And like I said, as far as what Fred was saying about was this bullet hole there previous, where did uh, you know, that bullet hole come from in the store? which is why I asked the question, did you guys do ballistics? How dare you, you know, print some pictures and present a stack of photos to a family to try to substantiate a weapon on an individual that never took his hands out of his pocket. Um, and when you haven't done ballistics on a gun and a bullet, and there's no forensic, I mean, there's no forensic done to, to, um, testing to see if there was gun residue on an individual's hand that was wearing a cast. You know, to me, I move less and less away from the questionable piece, you know, because as, as more and more answers get raised, it's just like, do you think we're stupid? Do you think the public is dumb? So when they're not releasing everything, because I'm going to tell you, in the family dollar footage, not only did he not take out his hand, the body language of the employees was not body language of, of there's a threatening situation going on. So to your point about the, the employee or the manager, I believe he might have been in the red when the police came in. He was startled because I don't believe that he was in a threatening situation. So to see the police come in there was the abrupt incident. That was the event that made him feel threatened. And that's when you see a change in his body language. The young lady who called 911. If, if you've ever been in that store on, on, on Main Street on West Main, the door is adjacent to the cash register or where, well, I guess adjacent to the, the line of registers, there's several registers. So in my mind, I mean, and this is, this is the part where I can assume, you know, if there's a guy in the store with a gun, I'm not walking to the back of the store to trap myself off. I'm going out the door, you know? So I asked myself questions like, well, why did you leave the front to go hide? She said, I'm hiding in the back. You go all the way to the back of the store where you claim there's no other exit because she said she, could, she couldn't go out the back door or whatever. But all you had to do was go out the front. So the, door, the door, you could have ran outside to ask for help, call the police. To me, that, the safe place to me is outside the store where the gunman is. That's me. I don't know who else would have felt like that. I've unfortunately been in a shootout or two randomly, 
you know, and my first get, get as far away from wherever I think the gunshots are coming from, you know, but um, her body language was casual. She had a basket in her hand. She's doing reshop, which means she had several items from the store that she looks like she was going to put back in their rightful places um, on the shelves or what have you. She didn't run away. She walked away. The, the, the other two employees that were there, just it looked like business as usual to me. The only thing, I mean, there were in, there were uh, customers <laughs> shopping. There's a gentleman in the store that's a customer, and he's directly on the other side of the register. And he was either looking at gum, whatever was on the other side of that register. I, we all have been in Family Dollar. Chips, gum, candy, Reese's Pieces, I don't know, whatever it was. He was bent down right on the other side. He didn't look like he was threatened. He was looking for candy and gum right on the other side of where this quote unquote robbery was taking place. This is what they don't want y'all to see. This is what they don't want the public to know. It's going to come out eventually, but they're trying to delay it as long as possible. I've seen it. You know what I'm saying? And, and after listening to the 911 tape, I assumed I was going to see a robbery, right? Because who calls 911 and says there's a robbery if it ain't one? And so after listening to that, it was kind of like a, okay, so we, let's prepare ourselves to see a gun pulled out, someone holding their hands up, what have you. None of that happened. You know, like I said, this is all bizarre. This all, to me, leans heavily on cover up and you know, telling telling people that someone concealed um, a weapon in a paper bag when I, I, I believe I've seen a bottle. I believe I've seen a bottle. It, it's not really clear, but I 99.9% .9 do not believe there was a gun in that paper bag. I absolutely don't believe that. And knowing that his mother said he left saying he was going to the liquor store, which is why we asked for blue light camera footage. There are cameras outside of Family Dollar. You can I mean, it doesn't start when he gets in the store. He comes from somewhere. So we need to see where he came from because those are other pieces to the puzzle. So, you know, like I said, it's not a lot of assumption for me. You know, only thing I'm assuming is that uh, RPD and the attorney general's office are doing a horrible job on trying to cover this up. That, that's that only assumption I have at this point. Barbara? So I noticed the first time I heard this story, so the, the first thing you heard was that the officers had shot and killed someone. And then the story that I expect to hear next is some terrible threatening thing that this man was doing that made it inevitable to shoot him. But they, they actually didn't say that in the first stories. They said uh, there were gunshots fired and it wasn't clear who shot first and there was a chase. And like all of that put me on the alert that this story wasn't going to make sense. And then the video came out and we didn't see any gun. We saw someone running away. And in the last few years, we've seen a lot of video of men, black men running away and being shot in the back by police, which I've never understood why that isn't de facto proof that the police are doing something wrong. Because, you know, if you, if you put all the worst things on these men that are being chased, they haven't done any capital crimes and yet we're jumping over we're not accusing them. We're not catching them. We're not doing anything. We're just executing because we feel like it tonight. That's, that's, this looks like another story like that to me. If, if you're shooting people in the back, they were not threatening you. They're running from you. And so to me, the, it's very suspicious. And the fact that they're trickling the information out and uh, they're just still clearly they're not telling us the story. We need the video from the store. And I agree with everything you said about the body language. None of what we've seen in any way makes it that situation where it would be inevitable for uh, shooting a suspect. And I completely agree with Howard. I'm shocked over and over at 
we see all this footage where they're shooting people on the back. And then you hear these stories about the white, actual violent criminals who they managed to catch and arrest with no injury to anyone. I, I see a complete double standard. And I think it's happening again here in Rochester. I was also really disturbed by the news story about the emails that were released between uh, the Locust Club and the city council members where the police are mad that the city council isn't backing them up. And the members quoted said, well, we haven't seen any anything yet and the and the locust club saying you don't need to see anything you just back us up based on what i mean they didn't even actually have a story about why it made sense to shoot anyone but they were expecting a knee jerk we back up our officers at all times i mean uh i i'm really glad that it's automatically true that it goes out of the RPD and to the attorney general to investigate this because there's such a long history of not good investigation. I hope she's going to do a better job than she did with Daniel Prude, which I didn't feel like she did. She did the right job there. And now she wants to run for governor and I, I want to see what she's doing for us, you know, Howard. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not sure that I can really add anything. Sort of like reiterating what has already been been said. You know that Barbara just finished saying that Antonio said parts of what Fred said, but the discussion itself is uh, frustrating, right? We're trying to somebody used I think it was Fred said we're trying to unravel, right? And so it lends to speculation. Some of it is speculation, right? And and so one of the one of the things, one of the logical questions seems, with seems to me that one of the lot of logical questions is, is, and people have already raised it, why won't they release all of the information, and then we can get at the truth? Why won't they show us the footage from the store cameras? Why won't they show us the blue light stuff? Why won't they show us unredacted RPD footage? RPD has a state of the arts criminal lab. They can take that footage and blow it up and slow it down to a point you could see exactly what happened. You could see what was in the bag. You could see if there was a gun. You could see if he shot. You could see everything. Why aren't they doing that? That's what, that's one more thing that leads me to believe that there's a real possibility of a cover-up, even though I know we're speculating, but I, 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 some some speculation you know, not all speculation is the same. I like to hear what their what their narrative is based on. I, I heard press say we don't want to create a false narrative. We don't, but it doesn't seem to be false. But I like to hear their narrative. We're not even hearing their narrative. What is it? What is their narrative? Like 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 Barbara just said, it seems to be the situation. Just believe us because we the police. No, that won't cut it. That won't cut it when you know the history. When you know their history, that won't cut it. So so. That's like, why don't you just show us everything? Show us everything you got. And then we can stop speculating. The idea that the past has some relevance to the present is an understatement. The past has a lot of relevance regarding the present. We're talking about centuries old patterns, y'all. Without, I'm not exaggerating. We're talking about patterns that have existed for centuries, literally hundreds of years, since the beginning of police departments. And so the past is very, very, very relevant. It's important for us to accept that, to, to grasp that and, and know it, that the historical patterns are very, very important. Um, and just, I don't know if we're going to talk about the emails or not, but the article about the emails from the Locust Club and the city council, that was amazing. We should be shocked. I wrote about that. We should be shocked about that, man. There was some stuff said in there that's really, really alarming. You got the president of the Locust Club, the president of the police union talking about the doggone city going to burn down. 
We yeah, this is we ought to be really, <laughs> really alarmed. You got a city councilman saying that there are police on the streets who should have never been there in the first place and that the locust club president knows it. So how come you haven't told us that before now? What are they doing on the streets? So it was a lot of stuff in there that, that really is um alarming in those email in that report about the emails. And just lastly, I wish I could take some comfort in the fact that the attorney general ultimately has the you know final say in terms of the investigation. But I take no comfort in it. I have no confidence in Letitia James at all. What she did <coughs> in the Daniel Proulx case is, in my view, criminal. This woman hired a so-called expert that has a long history of helping to get police off in situations like this. There are lawyers all the way out in California who were talking about how much they respect Letitia James, but how they were just baffled by the decision that she made to choose a, 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 a so-called uh, expert witness for the um, for her for the prosecution or whoever she represents for the people she represents the people supposedly to testify about the way he was the way Daniel Pru was killed. It was it was amazing. Lawyer, attorneys, I don't know if y'all know, attorneys all over the nation was talking about that. That they how they couldn't believe it. So I got zero, zero confidence in Letitia James. In fact, I believe she's playing politics in in terms of trying to parley favor for the election. As that's what I think. I think she's playing politics with people's lives. And if she comes back with some decision this time, similar to what she did in the Prue case. Politically, I'm speaking politically now. We ought to call for her head politically, in my view. Fred? Um, I just wanted to add that um, it seemed kind of suspect to me that right from the beginning that we have the video being released by the AG and not the RPD. Um, it seems to want to say that the AG is on board from the beginning because this is unprecedented in, to me that the AG would come automatically from the jump and get involved. Usually it, they get involved when there's an issue between the community and the police of what happened in a given situation. So then, like I said in the beginning, that there's a lot of questions as to why is this happening the way that it did. And then I don't know if um, Antonio, you, Antoni, Antonia, <coughs> excuse me, you may be able to answer this. What, if anything, did the other employees say that may have backed up what the employees said in the back room? Because what, ha what she said could prelude into what mindset people had when they came to the store, you know? And so it just so many questions, even not just for the police, but what is the other employees or the people that were in the store, what are they saying that corroborates either the police or um, the um, suspect? that died is in who's what conversations corroborate which story do it, you know because the question is, i'm have still having in my mind was he really robbing the store and um you, like like you see as far as statements um i was told that there possibly may be a statement from one of the managers but I haven't been able to confirm that, so I can't put it out there yet. I haven't seen it. But it's possible that one of the managers said that they didn't know the store was being robbed. And I believe that may be the gentleman, um, well, you guys can't see. But um, in the body cam footage, it shows him. I guess he dove onto the ground. I don't know if that's the same gentleman that, that possibly may have made that statement. Um, I believe he's a manager. So on top of Simran never producing or presenting a weapon, a gun, touching anyone. Um, to be honest, I mean, 
it didn't even look like he was necessarily having a conversation with anyone. Something may have been said, I'm sure. But, you know, because there's no audio, all we do have to do is go on back on, um, on, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, body language. Um, the, the cashier, if you didn't know what was supposedly taking place, you would think that she was switching the drawer. She took money from one drawer and then she opened up another drawer. Um, and I'm sure we've all been in a Walmart or some other store where there's a shift change and one employee will take a register out and, you know, maybe take it with them or what, what have you. But no money was exchanged from the cashier to Mr. Gordon either. So again, what made this other employee casually walk all the way to the back of the store um, and make this statement. Um, and there are some, some key things that she says in the statement that are a little odd to me. And I get Fred's point about, you know, we don't know what we do in that situation. Um, but like I said, me being someone who's actually been in, around gunfire um, and felt a threat for my safety and my life, I'm running full speed as, as fast as God and the angels will take me in the opposite direction. I'd never put myself in, 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 in an enclosed space. I, I feel like me personally, and this is me, if she had the wherewithal to calmly walk to the back of the store, she could have just as easily walked and made a turn and went out outside. You know, to me, I don't know that that wasn't the move to go out to go to the back of the store. And after she walked away, you know, like I said, there's people shopping. There's a guy in there shopping. He's right in front of them. He's, he's looking for gum or whatever's in the, on the other side of that register in those little spots. He's he's looking for a snack, Slim Jim, candy, candy, whatever it is that's there. That's what he was focused on, you know, but he's right directly on the other side of the register where the cashier and Simran were standing, you know, so, so there, there's no way he would not have known, you know, that someone was robbing the store. There's no way he wouldn't have known someone was robbing the store. So, you know, and I, and, 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 and from what I hear, geez, this is, I don't know, two or 300 yards from his house because his house home on Troop Street was directly behind the family dollar. You cut down one of those streets and you can see the store. This is a store he goes to all the time, you know. Um, so, I mean, I, my local family dollar, you know, I go in there all the time. And um, if I was to go behind the counter, they'd probably be like, hey, what are you doing back here? You know, but no one ever told him leave from behind the counter. No one ever gave him any money. No one did anything that made me feel like they were afraid or scared. You know, they walked back. They walked back and forth freely, you know, and, you know, we saw what we saw. And then we saw the police come in and we saw Simran turn and run. And the police officer took, at, took off after him. That's what we saw. So I don't know what I'd call that, but I wouldn't definitely, absolutely 100,000% would not call that a robbery at all. Fred, is your hand up again or? Yes. Yeah. I just I also just wanted to to um, bring to light um, two other things. And I don't know if this was seen um, by Antonia as well, is that the one officer said she had her foot on the gun. And why don't they have or did they have pictures of her having, you know, where it is? Because normally at a scene, they'll mark it off. Um, with a um, root type, uh, L-shaped ruler type thing so that you can know about or gauge how big something is. Um, the other thing was, is that from the angle where she was standing from his body, saying that her foot is on the gun and the way he was running, it's hard for me to assume that just, you know, just with physics, that if he's running forward, that the gun went that way and, and to that distance to where she was. If she wasn't close to him, you know, she was quite a distance away to, from him because she couldn't reach out and touch him. So she was a distance away. And it just seemed hard for me to see that gravity and just physics would make the gun go 
to you know go right when all his body movement is actually going left. And if the gun was in the bag, why is the bag still there, but the gun gone? It, there's a lot of questions, like I said, that are just suspect of, you know, that needs some answers to for clarity to figure this whole thing out. But by those questions not being answered, it does look like something amiss is going on behind the scenes. Because that, that is key to me is that, well, if the gun, she had her foot on it, then why aren't you showing it? This is the gun. So I, I, I just don't, that doesn't, um, uh, just those things alone don't make sense. She said the gun wasn't low or the chamber wasn't loaded. So that has to mean that the gun isn't an automatic. It's a, uh, a chamber, a cylinder gun, um, like an uh, Old West style or 38 um, type gun where there could be a bullet in one chamber, but not a good bullet in another one as you go around. But if it was an automatic, that means that the chamber is already automatically moving up. They don't skip. So that's another thing, you know, what, what kind of gun, you know, was it? And if her, she's saying that there was nothing in the chamber. And if you listen closely, I think one of the officers tried to stop her conversation about the gun itself and what she was depicting. Antonia, is your hand up again? Yeah. Um, so from watching the video again, there's, um, when he runs, one of the officers runs directly behind him, and then another officer is on the opposite aisle, and then they meet up after he's shot and he's laying on the ground. And like you said, I'm not a physics major or anything either, but just knowing how, you know, the direction of things and how it works, if he was shooting with his left hand, first of all, that one officer had his hand on his hoodie right at the bottom by his waist. So he was already too close to be shot at. You see what I'm saying? He was already too close for him to shoot at him. He, maybe, possibly, if, if, the, if that was the case, he would have shot past him. But it would have went somewhere in the direction of where the cash registers and that, that part of the store was. It wouldn't have been straight back. I mean, you know, it would have went maybe somewhere towards the front door, somewhere towards the, the, the registers. But that officer was already right up on him to be able to reach out and grab him. You know, you can see in the video that his hand was actually on on his clothing. He had a green belt and he grabbed him um, and Sivan, you know, ended up getting away. But then he ended up he ended up shooting him at close range in his back. You know, Sivan never turned around. He never bucked. He never, um, you know, bolstered up against him. He never shown a weapon. He's running away, you know. They could have tased him to find out if he had a weapon. You know, th there was other things that could have been done, you know, non, non lethal. You know, he, there was no imminent threat of danger. And I do understand if, if someone calls and says someone's being held at gunpoint, but the officer, he, he, he got there, he had his gun out and then he put his gun back. And then, so, so to me, it was like, well, if you didn't walk in with your gun, why take it out now? Why either are you untrained or you just, you know what? I'm going to kill him, you know? So both of those are problematic, whether it's your training or whether it's your, 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 your thought or your bias, that implicit bias that we hear about all the time, whichever one of those made you take your gun back out. Cause you walked in the store like, Hey, anybody in here got a gun? That again, what, what officer comes in the store asking if someone has a gun, who's going to say, Oh yeah, I got one. I got a nine millimeter. Who's going to say that? You know? So just, this whole thing is, you know, more of the more of the same bizarre stuff that doesn't really make sense. It doesn't settle well in your mind because something's not right. Because there is a cover up, you know.